Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Dr. Henry Ponder, an economist, a university president, an administrator, and just an all-around wise individual I've had the great pleasure to know because his daughter is the godparent to my children. And Henry, before uh, we begin to talk, I want to remember in 2016, when you came to the conference that INET ran in Detroit, Michigan, on race, inequality, and the future of our society. And you were sitting in the audience, and I remember seeing a young, very vibrant, now the leader of the Kerwin Institute, Derek Hamilton, up on stage and he looked over and he saw you and he said, oh my God, I just have to say hello to Henry Ponder. And he was just, I just remember his reverence for seeing you there. And uh, obviously I was very proud that you were there as well. So thank you for joining me today in this very difficult time with this uh, pandemic and with, I hope in this next hour, an opportunity to explore a long vision from your life, which is moving strong, walking the dog in the morning, and you've gone by beyond 90 years. So uh, I think there's a lot, a lot that you can impart. But first of all, thank you for being here. Nice to be here, Rob. So you were a young man, you grew up in Oklahoma, and you had a bachelor's degree from Langston University, and then served a little bit, uh, uh, I guess a couple of years or so in the uh, in the army in the Korean War. Spent some time in Korea, Tok Tokyo, Japan, and then did a master's at Oklahoma State Agricultural Economics, a PhD at Ohio State University. By the way, I won't hold that against you because my father was an All-American swimmer at University of Michigan. But oh goodness, we'll get, we'll get over that. You know, <laughs> what do they say? Oh, how I stay. They on the one side, oh how I hate Ohio State, and on the other side, the only good Wolverine is a dead Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, tell me about the economics that you studied, when agricultural economics, and uh, you'd come back, like I mentioned, from the war. What was the focus of your studies and what was the nature of your curiosities that led you in the direction of economics? Well, uh, that came about almost by accident. Uh, I give credit to uh, my uh, battalion commander when I was serving in, in the Army. Uh, he and I had uh, a few conversations when we were not doing our Army work. And uh, he was a West Point graduate. And he asked me what I was going to major in when I went to graduate school. And I told him I hadn't decided yet. And he said, well, you ought to think about economics. And I thought about that and said, you know, that's a good idea. And I decided I was going to tie that in with the agricultural experience I already had and then get the economics, academic part in economics that I needed. And it worked out very well for me. Uh, I, I, I thank him. I can't remember his name, but I sure thank him for making that suggestion for me. Uh, so the Army wasn't all bad for me either. But uh, I went to, I got out of the Army in the last of November, and I enrolled at Oklahoma State University <laughs> the 1st of January of, of 96 and uh, had the people to look at my transcript from college and they thought it was pretty good and they enrolled me in my courses and I took uh, the agricultural courses that were there and Oklahoma is at that time was a wheat growing state. I think that was its major crop at that time that it has changed over time and my master's thesis was uh, on grain elevators. I was talking about how they operated and uh, how they preserved the wheat for later on in time and 
that turned out to be very well. And uh, then when I went to Ohio State, uh, just to show you in, in, in the few years between 58 and uh, 61, uh, things had changed so that when I got to Ohio State, I picked up the topic of how to uh, how a supermarket should uh, rotate its checkout counters so that uh, they wouldn't have long lines as people going out. And I spent a lot of time going through that and eventually ended up uh, telling the supermarket chain the best time that, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, that they ought to have a full staff of people to keep people from in line. This was uh, really about the beginning of the big supermarket uh, change getting started. And I think that helped out uh, very much. So that just gives you an idea where agriculture changed from just a few, four years that I was involved with it. Uh, but the marketing system, uh, we, we talked about how we would get the things from, uh, the milk was a problem in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, and how they had to get it to the markets all over the country. That was a part of it. Uh, we even had uh, a, a lot of talk about how we ought to rotate our crops to make sure that uh, we were continuing to uh, educate the people, not only in this country, but that the farmers were making a good living while they were doing it. Uh, and then, uh, after that, I, I got into administration for some reason and kind of drifted away from that, but I sort of kept up by reading about it as I went along. Uh, so I think that's, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of how I got all of that, put all of that together and ended up uh, where I ended up. After leaving Ohio State, uh... Where where was your first uh, first stop as a administrator or or economics faculty member? My, okay, my first stop was at uh, Virginia State College, which is now Virginia State University in Petersburg, Virginia, and I went there as uh, the chair of the department of agribusiness. Agribusiness was a big thing at that time, uh, and I spent uh, my time there. And I, I did a lot of uh, uh, research, not writing, but but in, in research and speaking on uh, part-time farming and uh, Social Security. Uh, during those times, many of the farmers in in Virginia were not uh, taking advantage of the private uh, entrepreneurship of farming and joining uh, the so Social Security so that they would have some retirement when they came on. So I did a lot of talking through the community. I had plenty or, or many uh, town meetings with uh, local farmers to tell them that they ought to be sure and pay so that they could get that 10, 10 quarters in so that they would have that for retirement. And I think that helped quite a bit. But also the part-time farming uh, was something that most of the, the, the African-American farmers in Virginia most of them were part-time because they only had a few acres of land that they had saved in, in terms of the family over, over time. They had, all of the big plantations, most of the Af African-Americans did not have any, any of the big acreage 
So it was part-time and I did talk about the fact that Part-time farming was was a way of life for African Americans, and without that, they would have been much poorer than they were otherwise. And and then uh, later on, uh, the American e- Farm Economics Association asked me to do a research paper on uh, the African American farmers in the country. And I did an article that later appeared in the American Farm Economic Journal on the status of African-American farmers in this country. And uh, I traced it from back just after slavery until the present time. That was about 1968, I believe. And uh, they had lost tremendous amount of acreages over that time. And it was my prediction that if they didn't get some kind of support from the federal government and the state governments, that they would eventually lose lose all of their land because especially in the South where they own most of the land, the segregation issues kept them from being able to get the loans that the government had uh, to help farmers make it through. And I I was happy to see that later on, the federal government, U.S. Department of Agriculture decided they needed to do something about helping those farmers out later on. So I I put up, that's how all of that uh, worked together. And I did that last piece after I left uh, Fort Valley and, uh, went to Alabama A&M, and that was my first try at trying to write a dissertation, a research paper. While I was at Fort Valley, which was in between Virginia State and Alabama a and because of the segregation issues, and that was just a way of life when I was growing up. Segregation was in the South, and you had to learn to live with it, or you wouldn't do very well. So you, you just learned to live with it. You didn't accept it, but you, but you lived with it. And uh, I wrote a paper on uh, the uh, economics of, of, of segregation and what segregation was costing the various ministers in the little town of Fort Valley, where Fort Valley State College was located, just because they would not let black Americans come in and treat them the way they should have treated them. And it was, it was, I I think that got published. And I think that helped some in the eventual desegregation of what happened in uh, Fort Valley Georgia. So I guess over time, I used my agriculture, combination of agriculture and economics to try to make life for the individuals that I had to deal with more favorable uh, in the environment that they had to put up with. Uh, So that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of how I combined the economics and the agriculture along the way. Well, I uh, am fascinated by what you might call how, unlike some theoretical economists, you were inspired by the context in which you lived at the time and some of the very painful things that you were coping with uh, as an African-American individual or studying African-American communities. The, uh, there's a lot of concern now with the onset of this challenge. I, I draw the analogy to being like an alien from outer space, this pandemic. All societies and all peoples are being threatened by this. And uh, from what I've read, 
there there continues to be an inequality of what you might call access to health care or quality of nutrition, health, and other things that underpin that make people of color and poor people uh, more vulnerable. But there's, how would I say, this is a very different world than the world you grew up in. I, I think you were probably a young boy at the time of the Great Depression and that window from the Depression to the start of World War II, I'm sure etched a lot of impressions into your mind. Do the, do do you, what you might call echoes of that time, come back into your focus now as you're watching society grapple? Oh yes, with something that's like like war preparation. Yes, sir. It it it, it really does, uh, and I I think that uh, just looking at it, uh, we had we had to live through. A lot of this, and, and and you mentioned the education, the the medical profession, and the kinds of problems that African Americans suffered through that. And I just want to just point up here that also when I got to Alabama A and M, because of that problem, uh, I did a lot of speaking and research on the disparities in uh, medical care. And uh, I, I talked, uh, they, I was invited out several places to give talks on that when people found out I was doing a little research on it. And the, the main thing that, that I think would surprise most people on that, and it might still be true, I don't know that because I haven't done anything with it, but at that time, and this was in the, uh, I guess if I had to put a time on it, it would be somewhere in the 70s and 80s, somewhere. And I discovered that an African-American with the same income, the same job, and the same health care policy, health policy, with a Caucasian going to the doctor with, let's just say, diabetes. The doctor would not make the same diagnosis and tell him what he should get versus what he told the white person. For example, we discovered that more black people were told were not told that if they didn't do certain things, they might lose a leg because of diabetes. And they had the same insurance that the white person had that got all of that information and technology. And we, I discovered that it wasn't that people were just discriminating. It was just that they unconsciously did things because they had different ideas about how tough the one group was versus the other group and how one could stand for for more than the other. Uh, so that that was tough. And, and I remember all during my youth days, and I must say that I never had the real problems of, in segregation that most African Americans had. I never had that because the doctors, even though they had separate waiting rooms, I think they treated my family very well during those times. And I think it was because they understood that we paid the same money that others paid. For some reason, I think that was the way that went. But during those days, uh, I, I, I think about the uh, infantile paralysis uh, 
scare that was going on during that time. And keep in mind that Jonas Salk invented the vaccine for infantile paralysis, I think in, in 1956. But all of the years before that, when a person had infantile paralysis, uh, they took medication and if it got worse, the cure was to put them in an iron lung, which was very expensive, and we did not have the same medical insurances that we have now, and the poor people did not have access to these things, and uh, it was difficult for them to make it. Somehow, they just accepted that. But when a person had uh, infantile paralysis in a community, all of the people were afraid to go around that family because we didn't know what caused that. Now, today with this pandemic, we know what causes it. We know what we can do to avoid it and all of that. When I was growing up, we did not know what we could do to avoid the diseases that were spreading around. When, when people got them, the tendency was just to almost not quarantine them in terms of locking them up. That isn't what I'm saying. But the people quarantined themselves away from them. And they didn't have the same kind of support from the community that others had. That, to me, is one of the main things that we have improved on in terms of our medical uh, technology and all of that. Now we know that if we stay 10 feet apart, that germ will fall before it gets to us and it's not carried in the air. It, it hits on something and we have to touch that in order to get it. And if we wear gloves and, and dispose of the gloves when we get home, we will not carry the drug, the germ inside the house. Now, imagine a person with infantile paralysis when I was a youngster. We didn't know what caused it. Some people just got ill. And, and some, some communities had what we have in now. They, they had a number of cases. And people said, hey, there's something in that community. So let's stay out of that community. Uh, that's what we didn't know how it affected us. So we just stayed away from everybody that did it. Now we can have conversations as long as we stay 10 feet apart. Uh, this is the kind of thing that I think I have lived to see and certainly I'm proud that we have arrived at that way. And I think that because of that, we're going to get through this pandemic. It'll take a while because we have to get up to speed on all the things that we need to do. But the citizens of this, of this country and of the world are now doing the things individually that they can do to avoid it. And that's what's going to cause us to get out of this pandemic earlier than we would have had this pandemic hit us in 1936. We would have been in trouble, serious trouble. In uh, the course of conversations that you and I have had over time, I, I became aware that, you know, in addition to an economist and university administrator, you, you have been extremely devoted to what I'll call broader social purpose. I recall that uh, you were the president of the National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education. You've shared with me that you knew many presidents of the United States. I believe Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, uh, and probably more. And 
one of the things I found most striking, and I'll bring that back to the edge of the pandemic, is that you were acquainted with and had spent time with both Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa, people who went to those stressful, crisis-prone parts of, of life and world, it, in, it, obviously in their own regions, being South Africa and India. But what, what did they impart to your spirit from knowing these people, from knowing people like presidents of the United States who have a responsibility that is vast on their shoulders? And, and what advice would you ask their, how would I say, the ghosts of those experienced to impart to our leaders today? Uh, let me start with Mother Teresa. Uh, we had a meeting with her, with our, our group, and uh, this small in stature young lady uh, walked down the stairwell and out into the lobby of the building uh, where college presidents and their spouses were. And she said, let's have prayer. And we had prayer. Now, let me tell you what was striking about that. We had been all in India for six or seven days. And we had had uh, ministers. Some of our presidents were also ministers. And not one had said, let's have prayer. That struck me about the quality of this lady. And then in her talking, she talked about how we have to learn to help the people who need help most. That's, that was, in essence, the, the theme of what she talked to us about. We need to be able and want to help the people that need it the most. That's what I got from her. You, you don't need, I didn't need to try to convince other presidents of something. I needed to try to convince a number of students that they ought to do right and do better than they could before. I had to try to get farmers to do better. That's, that's what I got from that one. Nelson Mandela, uh, we went there again, a, a group of college presidents and their spouses, and we went to his office and his aide met us and talked to us and we said we'd like to see Nelson Mandela and he said, well, Nelson Mandela has a full schedule for today and he just will not have time to see you. And uh, we said, well, just go up and tell him that we're here and we'd like to see him. He said, well, I will, but I tell you, you can't see him. And he went up and told him, and he asked, well, who is it that, that wants to see me? And the aide said, a group of African-American college presidents are downstairs. He said, I have to see them. And he came down and spent over two hours talking to us. Now, what did I get from that? Is that you just never never should be too busy to talk to someone that can help you put forth the message that you're trying to put forth to the people you're trying to put it forth with. Now that's, that's what Mandela got. So I have then said, I'll never be too busy to talk to someone 
the least of these, tie that in with what uh, Mother Teresa said and what he said. So that's what I got from them, is, to, is never to outgrow your need to talk to people who ne you need to talk to. Now, I met a number of college presidents, as you mentioned, and I want, want you to know that I've met the Republican presidents and the Democratic presidents. And the one thing that I have gotten from, from just our conversations with them, uh, most of them tried to answer what and give us relief from what we were talking about. So let me say that. I wouldn't, wouldn't try to put one over the other in terms of that. They all listened and they all responded very well to what we were doing. But the thing that I got from those meetings were that in this country, we are all Americans. We are not Republicans. We are not Democrats. We are not black. We are not white. We are not Chinese. We are not Hispanic. We are Americans. And as such, we ought to do all we can for each other. Now, that's why I think that most of our presidents are, that's why I think most of our citizens want to meet our presidents. Yes, they are human beings just like the rest of us. But they do, when they get in that office, that's something that says, I represent more than myself. I represent a country. And we like to think that it is the greatest country in existence. So we have to act that way. And those presidents exuded that kind of confidence and personality when I talk with them. So I think that what it says is that our leaders have to be able to never lose that common touch. And I think that so far we've had presidents who have not been able to lose that. And that has been good for this country. That's what I got from that, uh, Rob. So in this uh, extreme crisis, this pandemic, I would, how would I say, distill that people who are thought and spiritual leaders should, how do I say, continue to reach out and mobilize, which you might call our courage, our curiosity, to what you might say, pull, pull the cart together with them. And that these presidents who you met with, if they are to serve as an example for our current president and cabinet, it's to maintain that, which you might call, what do I call, unifying vision of what it means to be an American. And when that is brought to access to medical care, the nature of these various bailouts and who gets supported and the way in which people are treated when they are admitted to the hospital, all, all these different dimensions, those types of, uh, which you might call visions that all of these people imparted to you are very, very strong and noble. And they, they are confronted by tremendous fear as with the pandemic outbreak, which makes people not easily find their best self. And I sense that it's the role of leaders to help everyone find their best self in these dreadfully uh, frightening and, and challenging times. There's no question about that. And, and I think that when we listen to the, the uh, newscasts every day, that when, when they are talking, I think that they are trying to present that to the public. They're giving information which is, which is needed, and they're giving it in such a way that it does not turn 
the citizenry off. And that's why I think that the citizenry has decided they're going to do the things to stop this. Now, I know there are some, uh, there's some protests about let's get back into it. Uh, that's the American spirit. Now, let, let me say that, that our leaders are taking a leadership saying, well, it's going to be a coordinated effort. That's, that's, that's leadership coming to us. Individually, all of us want to be able to do what we want to do. That's what, that's what democracy and freedom is all about. But now we can't do that. And some people are more excited about it than others. And I think that by the, what the leaders are doing, I think the protests to get this country moving earlier than, than we should, I think that when they decide that we're not going to open it up until a certain day in the future, I think the general public is going to react very favorably to that, to that and go along with it because the leadership that they're putting, putting forth. And that's, that is so important for this pandemic uh, over in terms of other things. For example, if, you are, if you're afraid of something, and that's what we were in, in the polio pandemic, we were, we were afraid of polio because we didn't know anything about it. Now the leaders have told us everything they know about it. And we know what we can do. So instead of being afraid, we are just concerned that, that we want to be sure and do what we should do and not do what we should not do. That's the good leadership that we're getting now. The uh, uh, sense that I have is that one of the responses to this pandemic is... Uh, what they call social distancing. Uh, I don't like that term, by the way. I think it's physical distancing with social connection being fortified through new technology. But uh, so I think we all need our family and friends to stay in communication now and, and invigorate one another. And uh, so I, I but I, what I'm really curious about is you sat for roughly 25 years at the top of universities as president of a variety of universities. Uh, and this response is changing the nature of education. You could see things slowly coming along. I went to MIT and they put the electrical engineering undergraduate curriculum online, uh, People set up certification in places like Southern India, where people took the undergraduate uh, degree in electrical engineering remotely because all the materials were made available. But I sense now that the structure of the university, the structure of undergraduate education, maybe even K through 12 education, are in accelerating in the rate of change. And the nature of what will be faculty, what will be administrators, whether the whole world will use the same, say, Economics 101 course, or whether people will build mosaics electronically of bits and pieces of all kinds of different readings and videos. But I don't know. I, I, like, I haven't been at the masthead of a university. I'm curious how you see this challenge inspiring change and transformation in that realm. Well, the change is coming for sure. And you sort of described it the way it's going to be. I don't think any of us know exactly what it's going to be. The technology is going to be the thing that drives how we do it. But I think that we're going to have a lot more online courses. And I think that, uh, you know, textbooks have been very important to get us where we are. And everyone 
buying textbooks, the prices of textbooks sky high and so forth. But I think in the future, we won't have textbooks. We're going to have technology schemes of some kind that you just simply plug in and it is all there. Uh, and I think this is going to reduce that price and it's going to make it easier for youngsters to sit at home and learn the same thing that they have been learning sitting in a classroom. Now, the thing about that is that there's something to be said about sitting in a classroom with your fellow students and the camaraderie that you get there and the mixture that you get that helps with that education. But the knowledge, you can get that knowledge sitting at home on your television. I think that's, I mean, on your computer. And I think that's where we're going. Now, what this call, what this means is that our, our teachers now must become more technologically oriented. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think this pandemic caught some of our teachers by surprise, and they were not ready to put their courses on line for students to learn. And now everybody, even the high schools and, and, and elementary schools are doing this. So that says that we're going to move into this in a big way once all of this is over. There, there'll be problems with that that I think we have to think about solving. Uh, I think that uh, the other thing is that keep in mind that technology does not come without a cost. And when you say that you're going to reduce the resources because you reduce the personnel does not necessarily follow because the technology, not only does it have to be improved and kept up, but the maintenance of it is something. You're going to have to have people who will know exactly what to do. And these people are now going to be highly paid people. So that. Right now, the, the IT people are not the top paid people in our university systems. I predict that in the future, they will be in the top paid echelon of the administrators in that, and they will be in the top of the staff, pay on the staff role. I think that one, one thing I, I really believe is going to happen is that tenure is on the way out. Uh, and I think that a number of things already has exacerbated that to some extent. Uh, the reduction in resources, meaning finance coming from states for the school systems or in the uh, money from corporations and foundations drying up. I, I think that you can get adjunct professors at a cheaper price than you can get a tenured professor. And I think that's going to move uh, along that way. I think another thing that's going to happen is we are going to have to justify in higher education every course offering that we have. Now, by justify, you have to look at the end result how much is it contributing to what this university stands for? What is it doing for it? Are the students benefiting? Do they get a job because of this? Or do they get some uh, personality development from this? But you, you're going to have to find a way to justify the courses that you have. And in terms of departments, there will not be as many departments in higher education in the future as we have now. There will be combining of departments. I'm not at the point, uh, I haven't taken the time to figure out which departments would best fit together and all of that. But I think that will reduce some administrative, I didn't say that, but 
the administrative uh, faculty now are the highest paid in the university. And I think that we have to find a way to uh, move down some of that administrative cost. Uh, and that's where the combining of departments is going to be, where you've had 10 before, you only have five now, that cuts out five department heads, uh, that gives money that you can put into other things. Uh, I, th I think that we have to start looking at that. I think another thing that's going to happen in higher education, it will no longer be a four-year degree program. I think universities must reduce the degree time by at least one year. I think we will be getting bachelor's degrees in three years rather than the four years that it now takes. All of this is, is, is a part of what I think this pandemic is simply making sure that we know that we have to move differently from what we have done because of this, and we're going to start doing that. So in, in, in essence, uh, Rob, that's the way I see it uh, going. There are probably other things that uh, I haven't talked about, but certainly I think these things are definitely going to happen there. Uh, an adjunct, oh, a, a, a tenured professor, for example, has to have an office, has to have a telephone, sometimes a secretary. Now, all of these things is why an adjunct professor can move in Teach this. Three adjunct professors can come in. Well, let me take that off. One adjunct professor can move in and teach the load that a tenured professor has because he usually doesn't have more than two courses. And a tenured professor, uh, adjunct professor could easily take two, and his salary is much less than that tenured professor's drawing. All of these things are going to work on this. Oh, and I didn't mention, we also have to continue using administrators because the president's job now is no longer just running the university. When I was growing up in college, the president spent most of his time on the campus. He ran almost everything, uh, not ugly, I'm not using that term, but he knew what each department should be doing and was doing, and he was there to see that they did it. Now, since the funds have been drawing, drying up, coming from the state government, state legislators, and he has to go out now, or she has to go out, and make sure that he is known in the corporate and foundation world so that he can get the resources necessary to make up for what the states took away from him. So he, he is not spending more than three days on the campus uh, today, the major professors, I'm sure of that, because they have to make sure that they are out there. And now the president is the PR of the institution. Everyone wants to know what the president thinks about what is going on at that institution. Uh, so these things are going to force a number, more online courses, more adjunct professors, and an elimination of tenure. That's three things that I think are coming. Oh, I didn't mention, we will, because of this, we will not have the number of students that we once had to make up any shortfalls we might be having in our budgets. The students will not be there. That's, that's going to happen. Uh, and that means that we will not need to continue to improve the campus with dormitory buildings. There will be fewer dormitory buildings on campuses as we move 
it into the forward. Oh, and another thing that I just thought of, a college town in some of these cities where the major universities are, the, the college, the town has taken the college's name. There, it, it is more, the town is, and the, and the gown works very closely together. In the future with fewer students, fewer faculty, the town will not be as flourishing as it has been. So that's going to be a change that takes place. Uh, I, I, I just wish I could be around to see all of this happen. <laughs> well, I think uh, you've shed insights into <laughs> many different dimensions and, and uh, how would I say that's quite, you're almost qualifying as a science fiction writer for me there. <laughs> <laughs> but I, let me, let me talk a little bit. There's always, how would I say good and evil at present and every in, present inside of everything. And what I found a little haunting as I was listening to you is that at least in an ideal sense, the notion of tenure was created to give an academic freedom and insulation from human and social pressure so that their work, what you might could, could come from their heart and be a genuinely expertise that was a genuine public good, not a coerced <laughs> or uh, narrower agenda or not having to abide by silences and taboos for fear of, of offending <laughs> power. In this scramble for money and in this loss of tenure for technological and cost reasons, are we sacrificing some dimensions of academic freedom? Is that one of the casualties of this transformation? I think that that is going to be the casualty, either real or imagined. Let me, let me put it this way. Uh, I think that that's, that's going to be what the faculty will think that you, you, our, our freedom of expression is being taken away and so forth. And chances are that is true because uh, after all, the president still has the right to decide who works there and who doesn't. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I'm going to put it on the other end. Uh, and, and, and this really probably puts me into the fantasy world, really. It really probably does. But I think now boards are going to have to be more open in terms of what boards are supposed to do, and that is a board is supposed to make sure that the university operates the way they think that university should operate. Now, let's, we can talk about that's an academic. We all know what, what that is. Now, when, when boards start doing that and not trying to manage the institution in any way, boards are going to have to get out of the management of the institution in, in any way in terms of personnel and what goes on there. Now, with that, I think boards now must become more concerned about the character and the quality of the person they bring in to be the president. They have to bring in someone who will understand that the people who work at this institution are not working for me. They are working with me that they have to get a president who fully understands the difference between a person working for him or her or working with him or her. Now, that's the fantasy part of what I'm talking about. You, How do you uh, interview a person and know that because... I, I, you know, I, I say all the time, and w when I was there, I would say this, and that is, I would say to uh, faculty members, you know, when I see a picket line, 
outside. I would I wouldn't feel too good if you were in it. <laughs> and and that that's a hard thing because per, you can't separate the person from the job. And it's going to be tough, but I think that tenure has to go primarily because of the reduction in funds and the way the university is now moving. I, 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 that's, that's my opinion. Well, I, uh, I must say uh, <laughs> today, Henry, I've been, I've been down because your daughter, as I mentioned, is the godparent to my children. And I've been down and, and I've watched you after your 90th birthday, walking your dog Pearl on the beach in the mornings. <laughs> And I've, I've seen the vitality of your mind at our conference in 2016 and in conversations we've had. But it's a real treat to be with you today. And how would I say, I'm, I w will share this podcast with the entire world, but I, I wish I could put a ribbon on it for your, for your wife and daughters. Oh, I... You are you are a vital vital ninety two year old man that is it I just marvel at every time I see you but but how would I say a marvel again today you uh, have so much insight so much curiosity and so much enthusiasm for life and you've seen a whole lot of things some of which were very ugly so uh, I think you're a model for the kind of spirit that a social scientist and a citizen should aspire to be. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it very much, Rob. And the yeah, best of you. We, well, we'll come back, how would I say, in a few months' time as the pandemic moves on, and we'll we'll take a look at it from a different vantage very point. Very good. And uh, then maybe we'll go walk our dogs together. <laughs> okay, very good. I like that. You're welcome in time. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.